Hi guys, I'm Dee Dee West. Welcome to Broken Limelight. Here I'll be telling stories about true crime and scandals among celebrities like Hollywood stars and famous rock and rollers. Today I'd like to tell you the story of Mackenzie Phillips. I want to go ahead and give you a trigger warning right away. This story does contain themes like drug addiction and incest, so if you don't want to hear about that kind of thing, this would be a good time for you to change the channel. Mackenzie was born Laura Mackenzie Phillips to Susan Adams and John Phillips. She was known for her role in the movie American Graffiti and the sitcom One Day at a Time in the 1970s. If you're about my age, you might remember her from her roles in the TV show So Weird from the Disney Channel. She also appeared on season three of Celebrity Rehab, and more recently, she was in Orange is the New Black. Mackenzie's parents, John and Susan, had two kids, Mackenzie and Jeffrey, but they didn't stay together very long. When Mackenzie was about two years old, John left Susan for a 16-year-old girl named Michelle. John was about 25 at this time. Susan was a really proper lady. She was described as sweet and warm and always made life fun for the kids. This was up until she started dating a guy named Lenny who was abusive and Susan became an alcoholic. John ended up marrying Michelle in 1962 and in 1965 they formed the band The Mamas and the Papas. They became famous practically overnight and now that they're rock stars they decided to move to Los Angeles. Susan and the kids were living in Virginia at the time, and they ended up following John out to Los Angeles. On Friday nights, the kids would go stay with John and Michelle for the weekend and basically went into party mode. John was a rock star and a party person, and he was just a super charismatic dude. He liked to party and have friends over all the time, and after he became fabulously rich and famous, he started having rock stars over at his house to party all the time. So Susan and the kids were originally living in Virginia, then after John got famous, him and Michelle moved to Los Angeles, and Susan and the kids eventually followed. On Friday nights, the kids would go stay with John and Michelle for the weekend, and they basically went into party mode. One thing about John is that he always put his own pleasure before anything else, and sometimes that ended up putting the kids' safety at the bottom of his priority list. He was all about love and hedonism, and he never gave his kids any rules, so Mackenzie was known to sneak out of the house in the middle of the night and jump into the pool or the ocean naked. Mackenzie and Jeffrey would basically have to look for their own food because none of the adults would ever offer them anything to eat. The house was pretty much complete chaos. So these are just a couple of stories about Mackenzie's childhood just to give you an idea of what it was like in John's house. When Mackenzie was seven years old, Michelle calmly gathered supplies and pierced Mackenzie's ears. Mackenzie later found out that Michelle was actually on LSD when she did this. One time shortly after Mackenzie turned 10 years old, she was starting to go through puberty. Again, John had all of his famous rock star buddies over. In front of all the adults, John says, Look at my little girl. She's popping tits. In her memoir, Mackenzie says that word still makes her cringe. On the same day that John made that comment, he gave Mackenzie a big girl job. He taught Mackenzie how to break up weed and roll joints. He even taught her how to stick two papers together to make a fatty. I'm going to tell you, I had no idea that was a thing. So I guess I'm in the wrong time period. So since John's basically like father of the year, a lot of times he would just send a car or a limo to go pick the kids up from Susan's house and bring them back over to his house. And a lot of times when the kids got there, there would be nobody home and they would just have to sit around and wait for John or somebody to get there. One time, Mackenzie was sitting there by herself waiting for her dad to come home, and who shows up but Donovan. Donovan was a singer-songwriter. He was probably best known for the song Mellow Yellow. So Mackenzie and Donovan started hanging out, and they decided that they were going to make some brownies for lunch. So they start mixing the brownies together, and after they put them in the oven, Donovan suddenly says, Oh, you can't have any of these. Mackenzie's like, what the fuck, man? I mean, remember, she's 10 years old. And Donovan goes, Oh, these are special brownies for adults. Apparently, Donovan had found John's stash and poured it into the brownie mix. But Mackenzie takes one look at the brownies and she's like, fuck that. They look like regular brownies to me. So she takes one and then she takes another and then another. And pretty soon, Donovan and little Mackenzie are baked off their asses. 
laughing hysterically, and they're, like, sliding down the stair rails, just high as fuck. So Mackenzie got her first high at age 10. In case you're interested, Mackenzie has a ton of stories like this with multiple celebrities, and you can read all about them in her memoir. It's called High on Arrival. When Mackenzie was 11, she tried cocaine for the first time. Her and her brother Jeffrey found it while snooping around the house. I mean, it's not like it was hidden or anything. And the thing is that Mackenzie and Jeffrey saw people doing drugs all the time. It didn't seem like something bad. I mean, all they knew of it was that it was something that rich and famous celebrities did. So if anything, it probably looked glamorous to them. Nobody ever talked about drugs like it was a bad thing. This environment and lifestyle set the foundation for the rest of Mackenzie's life. So when Mackenzie's mom, Susan, marries this guy named Lenny, he starts beating the crap out of Susan. Before long, he ends up fighting with Jeffrey, and he moves out. And then not long after that, he loses his shit on Mackenzie, and she moves out too. So Jeffrey and Mackenzie each end up going to live with their dad. So now Mackenzie and Jeffrey are living at John's house again with no rules, so they're pretty much free to just ask him for money or drugs whenever they want, and he always said yes. Whenever John would have parties, Mackenzie would stay and hang out so she could get high with everybody. To give you another example of how few fucks John had to give, John actually had pre-signed a bunch of blank sheets of paper so Mackenzie could write notes for herself for being absent or tardy to school. This was pretty much because all the adults were on drugs and they were either sleeping in or too tired or just plain didn't feel like driving kids to school. Another shining parental moment. When Mackenzie was 12, she got a role in the movie American Graffiti. Her parents just bought her a ticket and put her on a plane to San Francisco by herself. So when she got there, the producer of the movie, Gary Kurtz, was like, hey, where's your guardian? And Mackenzie was like, um, I don't know. My mom just gave me a ticket and put me on the plane. Mackenzie didn't know it at the time, but Gary and his wife ended up having to scramble to get her temporary guardianship so that she could stay with them throughout the filming. She didn't understand any of this until much later. So American Graffiti premiered, and John had a new wife named Genevieve, and they decided to ship Mackenzie off to boarding school in Switzerland. Not too surprising at this point. So after Mackenzie's in boarding school for a couple weeks, she suddenly gets called into the headmaster's office. And he's like, hey, your father hasn't paid your tuition, and we can't reach him. So he says, you can stay in your room, but you can't go to classes or participate in any of the school activities. So Mackenzie ends up wandering around the campus for weeks without hearing from her father. So finally, after a few weeks, John finally sends a plane ticket for Mackenzie. She has this horrible trip. By this point, she's 14 and she's stranded in Europe by herself. She only speaks English. Her flight gets delayed or canceled. She like breaks a heel in the airport. But as soon as she steps foot in the United States, she realizes that everybody's staring at her. She's famous. People are finally recognizing her from her movie. And because she was in Switzerland, she didn't really realize it until she got back. And for the first time, she's not just known for being Papa John's daughter. She's actually famous for her own work. So Mackenzie finds her dad waiting for her at the airport, and he's with her cousin Patty. Patty says, welcome home, kid, and hands her a couple of quaaludes. So now that Mackenzie is known for American graffiti and living in the house where there's no rules, she spends all her time partying and doing drugs and having sex whenever she pleases, just as she was taught. After a night out, Mackenzie was hanging out with her friends Billy and Jody, and they got picked up by a hitchhiker. They thought they recognized this hitchhiker, but at one point during the drive, Mackenzie says, this isn't the way to my house. So the driver says, I think the gas cap's loose. So Jody and Billy hop out to check it, and Mackenzie tries to get out, and he stops her, and he says, you stay here. She tries to lunge for the door, and Billy catches on to what's happening and tries to grab her arm to pull her out. But while she's like halfway in and halfway out of the car, the guy put a knife to her throat and he stepped on the gas pedal. So the car's dragging Mackenzie in the dirt and forcing Billy to lose his grip on her. Once Billy and Jody are way back in the dust, the guy stops and pulls Mackenzie back into the car and rapes her. He told her repeatedly that he was going to kill her. When he was done, he threw her out of the car and sped away. Mackenzie ran all the way back to her friends with her clothes all torn up. They were sitting on the curb sobbing, and they had police officers with them. The next night, some of John's friends had overheard some guys talking about how their buddy had raped Papa John's daughter. That night, John left the house with a shotgun and disappeared for a day and a half. 
This moment gave Mackenzie some hope that her father actually loved her and wanted to protect her. And that's exactly what she always wanted. Of course, that feeling doesn't last long. John, Genevieve, and their new son, Tamerlane, leave for New York for the weekend, expecting to be back on Tuesday. So Mackenzie and Jeffrey were left under the care of John's friends, Marsha and Yippie. Tuesday came and went, and John started extending the trip. After a month, Marsha started getting sick and tired of Mackenzie and Jeffrey. I mean, they're constantly partying and doing drugs and getting into trouble and don't listen to a soul. So Marsha calls John to complain. And what does John do? He buys a plane ticket to New York for Marsha. So once again, Mackenzie and Jeffrey are abandoned and John calls his sister, Aunt Rosie, to come watch them. Long story short, John and Genevieve never come back. Aunt Rosie becomes the new caretaker. When Mackenzie was 16, she started working on a sitcom called One Day at a Time. She starred alongside Valerie Bertinelli, who played her sister, and Bonnie Franklin, who played her mom. They all formed a really close bond, and also Mackenzie's Aunt Rosie and her daughters, Patty and Nancy, also got jobs working on the show. So Mackenzie's finally surrounded by family, which is something she's never experienced. If you recall Mackenzie's experience working in American Graffiti when she was only 12, her parents just sent her off on her own, and then literally everyone in the cast was like at least 18. So her time on One Day at a Time was really her first time feeling like she had a family. However, the one person she really wanted to be close to was her dad. But John was just John. So one day, John and Genevieve said that they would come watch the show from the live audience, and Mackenzie asked the producer to reserve two seats for them. Mackenzie was like looking through the curtains before the show, and the whole time she was on stage, she was glancing at the audience, and the seats were still empty. He never showed up, and unfortunately, this was the first of many times. After the first season of One Day at a Time, John let Mackenzie spend the summer with him and Genevieve in London. So one night, John has Keith Richards over to hang out, and they're like crawling all over the floor looking for drugs, and they decide that they're just going to go out and score. So they told Mackenzie that they would meet her at Keith's house and to just wait for a driver to show up and he would be there to pick her up shortly. She ended up waiting and waiting all night and nobody ever showed up for her. She fell asleep waiting and at some point in the middle of the night, she woke up to find all the power out. It was likely that John just didn't pay the bills. This was something that he had commonly done. Her phone was actually dead. So she was 16 and all alone in this big flat with no power, no lights on, and once again sitting there waiting for her dad to show up. Mackenzie describes this as being a really dark experience. She knew full well that there was no guarantee that her dad or anybody would ever come back for her. She started scribbling in this journal like crazy. And she started wondering things like, what was so wrong with her that made people want to leave? Was she invisible? Did she really exist? She was super alone and had been literally abandoned. The only things she could find to eat were old bread and marmite. Mackenzie spent three days by herself in that house. John and Keith finally showed up and were just like, we're here. And Mackenzie couldn't even be mad at them because she was just so grateful that somebody had come back for her. So Mackenzie goes back to California. Remember, Mackenzie's living with her Aunt Rosie and her two daughters. And they're living in John's old house because remember, John had left to New York and just never came back and just left them all there at his house. So originally he's paying the bills and supporting them, but he eventually just stops. So the owners of the home get really pissed off because nobody's paying the mortgage and they come to the house and start confiscating furniture and everybody's belongings. When they get there, they see that there's a ton of damage to the house due to John's constant partying. Once Mackenzie starts making a ton of money from one day at a time, she rents an apartment for all of them to live in. At this point, Mackenzie has been doing drugs for years and has never had any rules. So Aunt Rosie is really losing control of the situation, but she can't really do anything about it since Mackenzie's the one paying all the bills. So Mackenzie just embraces her wild child and doesn't take answers from anyone. In fact, John had literally told her once, you're a Phillips and the rules don't apply to you. So this was all she really knew. When Mackenzie was about 17, she ended up buying her own house and moving out. Around her 18th birthday, she went clubbing with John's friend Yippie. Yes, this is the same Yippie who was once taking care of her while John was off in New York. Anyway, Mackenzie's hanging out with Yippie and she took some quaaludes. Yippie pulled over to pick something up from a club and for some reason, Mackenzie got out of the car. 
She was wasted and she apparently started stumbling up to some police officers saying that some guy was bugging her. And as soon as they realized who she was, they arrested her. When her dad heard about her arrest, he told her, it's about time you've proven that you're a real Phillips. When Mackenzie was 19, she made a guy named Jeff Sessler. After five days of seeing each other, they decided to get married. Everyone around her warned her not to marry Jeff. They said he was a terrible guy and that he was a huge asshole. But the night before the wedding, she got a call from her dad. She hadn't spoken to him in months. John flew out to visit with his friend Bob, and they got a hotel room just a few rooms down from Mackenzie and Jeff's. Jeff went to bed, and Mackenzie went over to visit John and Bob. Bob was also asleep, so Mackenzie and John pulled out their drugs and started to, like, compare them and share them with each other. Mackenzie took some downers, and she passed out. This next part is pretty disturbing. I'm going to play a clip of Mackenzie telling you the story in her own words. I woke up that night from a blackout to find myself having sex with my own father. I don't remember how it started or thankfully how it ended. Was it the first time? Had this happened before? I didn't know and I still don't. All I can say is that it was the first time I was aware of it. For a moment, I was in my body in that horrible truth, and then I slid back into a blackout. Your father is supposed to protect you. Your father is supposed to protect you, not you. That clip is from the Oprah Winfrey show. Mackenzie appeared on the show after her memoir came out. So the next morning after that happened, Mackenzie was horrified and confused, but she just tried to bottle it all away and go on with her life. She didn't end up marrying Jeff just yet, and they all flew back home to L.A. So months later, she confronted John and she was like, listen, we need to talk about how you raped me. And he said, raped you? You mean when we made love? Again, Mackenzie tried to just think of it as a bad dream and move forward. Mackenzie married Jeff not long after that, and their relationship was fueled by constant drugs, sex, and partying. When the honeymoon was over and Mackenzie went back to work on one day at a time, things really weren't the same. The show was still dealing with the aftermath from the news of Mackenzie's public intoxication and arrest, and she was now regularly showing up to work late and on drugs, even as far as nodding off on set. She had also lost a noticeable amount of weight. The executive producers finally told her, we're giving you a sabbatical. Go get well, put on a little weight, come back in three weeks. So Mackenzie stayed away from drugs for a couple weeks. She touched up her hair color and got a haircut, and she came back to the show looking good as new. But after just a few weeks, she was back to old habits, nodding off on set again, and everyone around her was seriously worried. Everybody really wanted what was best for her, but she really didn't think she had a problem. It wasn't long before she was fired from her job on one day at a time. John and Mackenzie didn't speak for months after their last encounter. It wasn't until John's mother passed away. After that, Mackenzie went to stay with John and Genevieve in New York. During this stay, John and Mackenzie, of course, did cocaine together. And John, always a man of fatherly advice, decided to tell Mackenzie, in fact, he decided to repeatedly tell Mackenzie, that shooting up or injecting the cocaine would give her a better high. In a weird way, Mackenzie kind of wanted to fit in with her dad. She always had this longing for his attention and for his approval. So John tied off her arm and got the drugs ready in the syringe, but he was like, I can't do this. So he walked Mackenzie through it. This was Mackenzie's first time using drugs by way of needles, and she would continue to do this for a large part of her life. About a year after Mackenzie's failed marriage to Jeff Sessler, John was arrested for trafficking narcotics. He was facing 45 years in prison, and he convinced Mackenzie to go to rehab with him. He did this so that he could show the court that not only was he reformed, but he was going to prove that he could help his daughter clean up her act as well. They completed a six-week outpatient treatment program at Fair Oaks Hospital, and then Mackenzie became a counselor helping kids and teens with drug addiction and alcohol problems. John was also, quote-unquote, recovered, and the two of them started doing anti-drug publicity together. With the trial coming up, John decided to start a Mamas and the Papas revival band. Mama Cass Elliott had passed away, and Michelle had moved on. So Mackenzie became one of the singers of what they now called the New Mamas and the Papas. 
Mackenzie started snorting cocaine again. She didn't start shooting up just yet, but it wasn't long before her lifestyle put her back in danger. It wasn't uncommon for her to hang out with people she didn't know and end up in an unfamiliar apartment with new junkie friends. One night, she went clubbing, and a group of strangers drugged her. She last remembers walking out of the club wearing a dress and holding a cocktail, and suddenly she woke up in a strange place wearing sweatpants. These guys had kidnapped her and held her for days, drugging her food, keeping her foggy the whole time. After five or six days, John's friend Big Sal came busting through the door. He grabbed her in her clothes and threw her over his shoulders and put her in a limo and took her home. After the new mamas and the papas started touring, Mick Barakin joined the band. Mick and Mackenzie fell in love quickly, and they would later get married and have a son named Shane. But there was something dark going on while the band was touring. John and Mackenzie started having sex regularly. First of all, this was not consensual. It started like this. The band would play show after show, and the mamas and the papas would party afterward. Mackenzie would black out, and in the morning, she would wake up in her father's bed with her pants down around her ankles and her father sleeping next to her naked. She'd wake up with no memory of what happened. She just wanted to purge this experience from her memory, but she was always this little girl just begging for his attention and his approval. And John was a man who knew no boundaries. He had no rules. His own pleasure was his highest priority in life. Mackenzie was really freaked out, but she really didn't know what to do. Unfortunately, that night became one of many nights. She would go over to her dad's room after the shows, and even though she knew what might happen, she continued to go back. For one, she wanted to get drugs from him, and two, she probably wanted to spend time with him, and this was the one way she knew how to bond with him. The fact that she was blacking out throughout the encounters also made it easier for her to put the reality out of her head. Mackenzie actually says that the idea of sex with her father repulsed her. The relationship they had wasn't, like, romantic. They didn't hold hands or kiss. This wasn't a consensual relationship, and it wasn't even something that happened every night. It was just something that would happen once in a while when they got really fucked up together. She did freak out about how weird it was, but her dad wasn't just supplying her drugs. He was also her boss, and he controlled her paycheck. It took Mackenzie some time to come to the realization that incest cannot be consensual. But it was hard for her to hate him, so instead, she hated herself. The quote-unquote relationship went on for years, until Mackenzie became pregnant. She didn't tell her husband Mick about what was going on with her father, but they already had one baby, and Mackenzie's addiction had already been putting a strain on the relationship. So they agreed that Mackenzie would get an abortion. This abortion would mark the end of the incest. When Mackenzie's son Shane was about three or four, she realized that she really wasn't being a great mom and she decided to go back to rehab. While there, she had this mortifying incident where she had her drug dealer deliver cocaine to her rehab and she couldn't find a syringe, but she found an IV tube with a needle attached. So she tried to make it work by like blowing into the end of the IV tube and blood sprayed all over the place. This experience was Mackenzie's last time using cocaine for 15 years. When Mackenzie finished her rehab program, she became the mom she always wanted to be. She drove her son to playdates, birthday parties, soccer practice. She would read to him every night. She hosted Tupperware parties, and she surrounded herself with other clean former drug users. Now that Mackenzie was clean, she distanced herself from her father. She tried to convince him to get clean too, but he was too stubborn and he refused. In 1999, Mackenzie got a job working on the Disney TV show So Weird, playing Molly Phillips. So she used her money from that job to buy a house for herself and Shane. In 2001, Mackenzie got a call letting her know that her dad was sick and on the way to the hospital. She rushed to his side and she stayed with him. It was clear that he wasn't going to live for much longer. Mackenzie decided to forgive her father once and for all. John was never a man to apologize or even act like he did anything regrettable. So when she apologized to him, he just looked up at Mackenzie and sighed and put his head on her shoulder. In John's last days, Mackenzie and her brother Jeffrey asked the doctors to up John's morphine because they thought that if anybody should go out under the influence, it was John. That night, Mackenzie went to the chapel in the hospital and picked up a prayer card and pencil and wrote, Please take my father tonight if possible. Early the next morning, Mackenzie got the call that John had died. It was a Monday. Mackenzie's husband Mick played the Mamas and the Papa song Monday Monday by John's side. 
Not long after John died, Mackenzie decided to get cosmetic surgeries like liposuction and a boob job. She was in a lot of pain after this, so her family doctor prescribed her Demerol, Vicodin, Thorazine, Xanax, and Valium. It wasn't long before Mackenzie was back to drinking, and people were starting to talk about her being fucked up all the time. And Mackenzie just insisted that she didn't have a problem and she was in legitimate pain. She eventually started using fentanyl and Oxycontin and getting multiple prescriptions and filling them at multiple pharmacies. She eventually tried detoxing, but it wasn't long before she found a bunch of syringes at her diabetic mom's house and started shooting cocaine again. Mackenzie eventually let her friends Josh and Lisa move in with her. They were drug dealers. So Mackenzie then started smoking heroin, and it wasn't long before she started shooting it up. In 2008, Mackenzie received a request to appear on The Rachel Ray Show for Rachel's 40th birthday. Her favorite show was One Day at a Time, so the whole cast was going to appear to surprise her. Before heading out to the airport, Mackenzie tucked a bunch of cocaine and heroin into her pockets. When she went through the metal detectors, they went off because she had the drugs wrapped up in foil. So they had her step aside and she took this little bag of drugs out of her pocket and she tried to sneak it into her waistband. They waved the wand over her and of course she started beeping. She started pleading with them saying, please don't bust me, my son doesn't know. And the officer was like, Miss Phillips, I'm sorry, please sit down over there. So when she goes to take a step, the bag of drugs slips down her pant leg. So she tried to put her foot on it and hide it. But then she's like, now what? I mean, she can't take another step with her foot on top of the drugs without exposing them. So this big old lady cop gets in her face and starts screaming, are you holding? Are you holding? And then she looks down and she sees the corner of the baggie under Mackenzie's foot and they arrest her. So Mackenzie's in jail and she's struggling a bit and her sister Bijou comes to see her. So Bijou tells her, listen, I'll bail you out, but you have to go to Narconon. And at first, Mackenzie's like, fuck that, I'm not doing that. But it took her like a day to be like, all right, I'll go. (laughs) So she says, fine, I'll go, but I want to go home and see my dogs first. Bijou actually brought a guy with her from Narconon. So him and Bijou waited while Mackenzie went in her house and checked on her dogs, supposedly. But instead, she goes and finds her roommate, Josh, and asks him for drugs. She shot up and shot up and shut up, and literally her sister and this guy from Narconon are like sitting there waiting for her to finish. And she finally comes out of the bathroom and goes into her bedroom, and it's like everybody she knows is there. All her siblings, her son, some of her closest friends, everybody's in her bedroom. So at this point, she's finally like, okay, let's go. Mackenzie spent three months in Narconon. When she finished her treatment program, Shane picked her up and took her home, and she's been clean ever since. I did my research on Mackenzie's memoir. It's called High on Arrival. Mackenzie released it in 2009, eight years after her father John passed away. She fully expected for her family to be shocked by the news of the incest, but what she didn't expect was all of the backlash she received. Her stepmother, Michelle, doesn't believe it to be true. She was quoted as saying, After 35 years with a needle up her arm, including several months while she was pregnant, It's difficult to believe much of her story. She has hurt everyone in her family tremendously and apparently feels no guilt or shame in doing it, or even how she decided to deal with her, um, memories. Her sister China, on the other hand, who is the daughter of Michelle and John Phillips, says that Mackenzie actually called her and told her about the incest back in 1997. You had known about this. Yeah, I knew. I knew for 13 years. Got a phone call from my sister and she said... There's something I really want to talk to you about. I really feel like you should know. I just don't want to hold on to this anymore. And uh, she told me about the incest. Mackenzie has come a long way in the last few years. She has received an outpouring of support and become a part of a community of incest survivors. She says it was with the help of this community and Dr. Drew from Celebrity Rehab that she learned about the dynamics of an incest relationship and how grooming can occur. What I've come to realize is that I was sort of groomed to believe it was consensual, that I was complicit in some way, that because I didn't scream and fight and that I participated, that made me at fault. And of course, that is the the huge thing that that all incest survivors 
suffer from is, is taking a portion of the shame and guilt onto their own backs. She now lives a simple life with her son Shane. I'm grateful for a simple life. I don't think that uh, high on arrival would signify a person who would be able to go on and live a simple life, but that's what I'm able to do. I wanted to tell Mackenzie's story because I don't think she should be remembered from her time on celebrity rehab or in tabloids. Mackenzie was a victim, and now she's a survivor. Since 2013, Mackenzie has worked as a substance abuse counselor. She is now a manager and counselor at Breathe Life Healing Centers in West Hollywood, California. She has come an incredibly long way, and that should be recognized. So that's it for today. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. You can also follow me on Facebook at facebook.com slash ddwestlv. Thank you, guys.